So today we're going to be talking about hybrid smart contracts and decentralized Oracle networks. Uh, and decentralized data, external computation, and all that. But additionally, for those of you who know all this stuff and who are familiar with this, you might go, oh, this is a little bit uh, of a refresher here. I'm also going to give you a gift. And the gift that I'm going to give you is the story that to tell your friends and family when you get home why you came here. Why you came to Eat Denver, why we're building all this weird stuff. Because a lot of people, they go home and they say, hey, like I went to Eat Denver, I did all this building. And they go, yeah, what is that, cryptocurrency stuff? That sounds weird. And they have no idea why we're here. So I'm going to give you the gift of the story of why we're all here. Nice. And for my introduction, my name is Patrick Collins. I'm a developer advocate uh, on Chainlink Labs. You can find some of my contact information here. And I absolutely love this space. I live, breathe, eat, sleep, smart contracts. I love builders. And I love the philosophy of what we're doing here. And the reason that I'm going to give you this gift, the story of what we're doing here, is because in order to understand Chainlink, in, under, in order to understand these decentralized Oracle networks, you need to understand the purpose of smart contracts. Why are we building all this stuff? And again, this might be a refresher to a lot of you, but I'm going to give you the story that makes it easy for anybody to digest here. So why are we here? And maybe even look at yourself. Why are you here? Why are you coding right now? Why are you part of this hackathon? Why are we as a community so excited about all this stuff? Is it the economic opportunity? Is it the random NFTs? Is it the Dogecoins? Is it the DeFi? Why are we here? And that's the question that our friends and family ask. Why did you bother going to eat Denver to hang out with Buffalo unicorns? Why did you go there? And the answer is trust minimized agreements. Remember this, this is why we're here. This is the simplest reason that you can explain why we're here. Now, if your friends and family are anything like mine, normally they'll go, what, what, what does that mean? I'm, that's really confusing. And I'll usually simplify by saying, we're here because we have technology that guarantees we can create unbreakable promises. And this is due to decentralization and this is due to the future that we're building. Not to be confused with JavaScript's un unbreakable promises. A little bit of uh, coding humor here. Love me some engineers. And in all of our agreements today, we have this issue of trust and promises. From things like services, like an oil change, you're trusting that they're going to change your oil and they're not going to stiff you and they're not going to do anything bad to you. You're trust There's a trust assumption here. If you go to a bank, you say, hey, I'm going to put my money in you. I'm going to put my money and you're going to keep it safe and we're trusting that they're gonna do this. Or with the lottery, if we play a lottery, we're trusting that if we buy a lottery ticket, we're gonna have a fair chance of actually winning that golden pot at the end of the rainbow. But there's a trust assumption there. We're trusting that their promise that we have a fair chance is gonna come true. And to really nail it in, looking at real use cases where this trust has been broken and has ruined people is essential. So a lot of people go, oh, you know, I, I trust these big corporations, I trust these big groups. And we look at something like McDonald's. McDonald's had this promise a few years back, maybe uh, several years back, where they had this uh, Monopoly game that they were doing. Some of you might remember this, where they basically said, we promise if you buy our McNuggets, we'll give you a fair shot at winning $1 million. And in fact, between 13 and $24 million was stolen and when you bought the McNuggets, when you bought all these things, when you entered your chance to win, you had a 0% chance to win. Because all the money went to a centralized group that flipped the switch and had the power to say, nope, sorry, this is ours. And whether or not it was McDonald's fault, it doesn't matter. The thing is, there was a centralized power that had the ability to break their promise. We look at other examples, like banking. People say, hey, I trust my bank. My bank's great. Back in the day, there was, there was things called the run of the banks, right? When you put your money in the bank, the bank goes, hey, we got it. We're going to put your money in the vault. No one's going to touch it. But there's profit incentives there. And the banks say, oh, well, if we spend all this money, we can go make a whole bunch more money. And then so when a ton of people say, hey, we want our money back, the bank goes, Oh, whoopsies, we spent it all. 
And some people might say, okay, that was years ago, right? That hasn't happened in a long time. Okay, let's look at this, uh, a more recent example with Robin Hood. Robin Hood painted this picture. They made this promise. They said, hey, come use our platform and we will give you access to financial markets. We will give you the ability to buy, trade stocks, do all these things. And when push came to shove, what happened? There was a centralized force that they said, ah, but if we let all these people trade and buy these stocks and shares, we're gonna lose a lot of money. So maybe we flip the switch that only we have control over and disallow people to do this. We had this trust assumption and what did they do? They went back and they broke our promise. And this is why we're here. Because in traditional agreements, you always have this trust assumption where we have to trust that these institutions, these groups, are going to do what they say that they're going to do. But there's a conflict of interest, right? Does the lottery want to give out a million dollars? No, because that goes against their, uh, their for-profit motives. If they can find a loophole to say, ah, well, sorry, you know, you didn't meet the criteria, you didn't check a box, whoops, today's, we're not gonna give it to you. They own the, the, the contracts and they also execute the contracts, but they often have this conflict of interest of actually doing what they said that they're gonna do. And this is why we're here. We have a technology called cryptographic agreements, where the contract terms are baked into code and have guaranteed execution. And if a contract says, we promise to do X, Y, Z, it is guaranteed to occur. And we no longer have to worry of, about having these trust assumptions and having people breaking our promise. This brings us from this world where we currently live in, where previously we had these paper guarantees, these brand-based guarantees, where if we didn't like a service, Somebody made a promise to us. They said, hey, come use us. We'll do all these amazing things. And they break those promises. All we can do right now is walk down the street to some other group who's going to do what? Make the exact same set of promises. And this time, we got to hope that they actually fulfill it. And they actually fulfill their promises. We move away from that world to a world where we have cryptographic, math-based agreements where 1 plus 1 always equals 2, and we don't have to have those trust assumptions versus in the Web2 space where maybe if a for-profit entity says, hey, well, if one plus one equaled three, we'd make more money. So let's fudge some numbers and now one plus one equals three. That is impossible in the world that we're building at ETH Denver, at the blockchain community and with smart contracts. Now, I like to boil it down to that one piece because usually it gets a little bit overwhelming if we say, oh, it's also got great security, guaranteed execution, transparency, trust minimization, efficiency, can be a little bit overwhelming when you get so excited and you go, oh, here's why I'm here. So I like to boil it down to that one thing, but these smart contracts, these blockchains, they, they have all these additional features. And it just brings it back to, we're building a world where truth over trust. Where truth is what we want, we don't want to have to trust that someone's going to do the right thing. And we can do that. And the reason I think this is so important, too, is given two agreements, one with guaranteed execution, one where it's an unbreakable promise, versus one where you have to trust a human being to do the correct thing, which one are you going to choose? In my mind, it's going to be overwhelmingly the guaranteed execution. And to me, that's why we're working so hard and we're here is to re-landscape all these agreements with these trust assumptions to the ones that are guaranteed to be executed. So that's the story that you can all take back and you bring to your friends and family and say, this is why we're so excited. Sure, maybe you like NFTs, maybe you like Dogecoins, maybe you like kind of all the memes in the space. You can absolutely love that part too. But the real fundamental values come from these trust minimized agreements, these unbreakable promises. Now, this leads us into Chainlink. You might be thinking, oh my goodness, Patrick, this sounds amazing. I want to be a part of this world where people can't break our promises. This sounds great. Smart contracts seem really amazing, right? Well, they have a fundamental issue. And this is what's known as the Oracle problem. 
Smart contracts are unable by themselves to connect with external systems, data feeds, APIs, existing payment structures, or any other off-chain resource on their own. And this is a big issue, right? Because if I want to make one of these agreements, they can't talk to the real world. If I want to make a, an insurance agreement, right, an insurance unbreakable promise where, hey, if a tornado hits my house, you're going to pay me out, blockchain has no idea if a tornado hit your house. If you want to make a lottery with a random number, blockchains are deterministic systems. They don't know how to get random numbers. If I want to make a bet, just say, hey, I bet you it rains tomorrow, blockchain by themselves have no way of knowing if it rains tomorrow or not, and I can't make these incredibly simple agreements. So now you're saying, okay, Patrick, these smart contracts don't sound that cool. It sounds like they can't really do a whole lot of anything because all the agreements that I care about are going to use something off-chain. And the reason that they can't do it off-chain is because they're deterministic and they can't go into uh, variable data. So I'm going to skip a little bit of the technicals, but if you want to have, uh, we have time at the end for Q&A, so if you want to go into why the layer ones can't do this, we can go into that. We have a solution though. A blockchain oracle is any device that interacts with the off-chain world to provide external data and computation to these smart contracts so that they can make these unlimited, these feature-rich agreements. But the story doesn't end there. Because if you as the builders do all this work to build this decentralized logic layer on-chain, this decentralized model, and then introduce a centralized oracle or a centralized data structure or a centralized execution layer, what have you just done? You've just ruined all the work you've done to make this trustless, this trust minimized agreement and reintroduce a centralized vector, reintroduce a trust assumption. So having a centralized blockchain oracle or having a centralized data provider nullifies and ruins any chance of you having this unbreakable promise, this unbreakable agreement. So we can't have this. And this is where Chainlink comes into play, and Chainlink really shines. Chainlink is a decentralized Oracle network, which allows for decentralized data, decentralized external computation, so that these smart contracts can have all the feature richness of the Web2 space, so we can have end-to-end -end decentralized trust-minimized agreements so that both our on-chain logic layer is decentralized and our off-chain data and external computation layer is decentralized. End-to-end -end trust minimized agreements. And this gives rise to something called hybrid smart contracts, which are smart contracts that have both an on-chain component and an off-chain component. And most of the time when people are talking about smart contracts, they actually are talking about hybrid smart contracts, but the term is used a little interchangeably. If you look at the top 10 DeFi protocols, at least 50% of them have oracles as core infrastructure, and then up to 80% of them interact with decentralized oracles in some facet. Because the agreements that we care about probably need data or need to interact with the real world in some regard. Now, for the engineers here, this leads to rise to, okay, this sounds amazing. This is what I need for my feature-rich agreements. This is what I need to take these smart contracts to the next level. What can I do with Chainlink out of the box? What features come out of the box? What are the solutions I can do with Chainlink? And the first one that is the easiest plug and play and one of the most powerful features is Chainlink data feeds or Chainlink price feeds. And they're currently powering over $65 billion right now in the DeFi space. These are battle-tested, hardened price feeds, data feeds, securing DeFi. Now, what are these? If we want data about pricing information, for example, the price of Ethereum, that is a value that we as human beings have assigned to Ethereum. Hey, Ethereum is worth $3,000. That's something the blockchain natively has no idea about. So we need to get that information from off-chain, on-chain, in a decentralized way somehow. So there's a network of decentralized Chainlink node operators that source data from many of the top APIs, exchanges, and data sources, data providers, route it through a decentralized Oracle network that aggregates the information and delivers it on-chain in a reference smart contract so that any developer 
can now use this to build the future of finance, can build these smart contracts. And we can even take a quick look, depending on if the Wi-Fi actually works, uh, at uh, data.chain.link, and we can see an example of one of these data feeds. We can see ETHUSD. On the right side, we can see all of these independent node operators that are sourcing data, that are delivering data on chain. We can see the current trusted answer or the current decentralized answer from all these uh, data providers. We can see parameters, we can see price history, we can see uh, everything about all these node operators, and at the bottom, we can see a slew of DeFi protocols that are relying on these data, these data feeds to be decentralized, to be secure, to be up to date for any of their protocols to work. Some of them include synthetics for value, valuing underlying collateral, SushiSwap for doing margin tra trading, Compound for doing lending and borrowing, and Aave, again, for pricing underlying collateral. And these are DeFi primitives. These are DeFi protocols that allow us to rebuild these trust models in traditional finance and give us this world of decentralized finance. And we can go to the Chainlink docs and deploy one of these smart contracts in less than 60 seconds, well, depending on how the Wi-Fi is. Come to the Chainlink docs, go down to data feeds. Hopefully y'all can see this okay. We'll go to using data feeds, and all the code you need is right in the documentation. You can scroll down to this button, open and remix, and uh, I'm, I'm not gonna click it because the Wi-Fi has been a little bit, little bit spotty, so I already have it up. But you have all the code that you need to deploy one of these smart contracts with one of these data feeds and pull this information to build these incredibly powerful billion dollar applications in one click. So we come over, I'm gonna be on the Coven testnet. I'm gonna go ahead and hit deploy. A MetaMask is gonna pop up. I'm gonna hit confirm. I've got some Coven testnet in my MetaMask here. And uh, we're gonna hope that the Wi-Fi is, uh, is benevolent here. Oh, great, and it already showed up. And now I have a contract that reads the information from one of these data feeds, and I have a simple view function, I hit get latest price, and you can see the latest price right there, and now I can build these insane billion dollar DeFi protocols, or NFT protocols, or gaming protocols, or whatever you want to do with it. And for those of you who might be asking, who might be a little bit newer, the reason the number looks so astronomical is because decimals don't really work so great in Solidity, so it has eight decimal places that you, uh, you append on afterwards. What else? What's another out-of-the-box feature that Chainlink has? Chainlink VRF, which is a way to secure randomness in your decentralized applications. Maybe you want to build a lottery. Maybe you want to do random sampling. Maybe there's some other insane gaming application you want to build with random numbers. The reason that this is necessary to be off-chain is because on-chain RNG operators are risk. What a lot of naive developers do is they say, hey, you know what? I'm just going to use a block hash. I'm going to do timestamp, you know, block.timestamp, I'm gonna hash it with message.sender, or all these parameters that are deterministic and predictable. And if you use a predictable value in a lottery or another application that is dependent on randomness, you've kind of ruined the randomness aspect. So we need to look off chain to get a random numbers. Miners can influence the block hash, the block time can be predicted, they can throw out a transaction that they don't want. So Chainlink VRF provides verifiable randomness. It's a way of any application getting a provably random number on chain, and that's incredibly powerful. That way now when we build these lotteries, if you know, McDonald's uh, has this, their monopoly application, they can, you, everyone can transparently see on chain, okay, this was guaranteed to actually pick a random winner which is incredibly powerful. And this is used today by uh, tons and tons of different applications. Uh, Pool together for doing their, their randomized lottery, uh, Pokemons, uh, Avagochi, Axie Infinity, Ether cards for building gaming applications and, and NFTs that have a uh, random trait, which makes them truly rare, right? If you have the sole power to mint a million uh, rare NFTs at any time, how rare really are they? So Chainlink VRF is incredibly powerful. And uh, at the end, if we still have time, I can do a demo there. Um, but again, it's the same as price sheets. You can go to the documentation, 
You can scroll down to using VRF, one click, get it on Remix, deploy, get your random number. And VRF V2 was released two days ago, uh, which is incredibly exciting and it adds a whole bunch of optimizations. What else can you do out of the box? Chainlink Keepers, decentralized event-driven execution. Anytime someone makes some type of execution on the blockchain, somebody hit that play button. Somebody had to spend the gas. Somebody had to send that transaction. And if a single entity is sending the transaction, what's happening there? You've reintroduced a trust assumption. A single person has to press play. So is there a decentralized solution for this? Oh, well, yes, there absolutely is. Uh, and then earlier this week, uh, another Chainlink developer advocate, Sol, uh, did a fantastic presentation on Chainlink Keeper, so I highly recommend you all uh, check that out and watch it. Uh, but basically, you have a network of Chainlink nodes off-chain that read a decentralized registry contract on-chain where all these different applications have registered some functionality they want to check for. Maybe it's at 7 p.m. every day, send money to my cousin, kind of like a cron type thing. That could be a, an event that you do. Maybe it's when the price of ETH hits a million dollars. Buy a ton more. That's another event you could do. Maybe it's when a liquidity pool hits a certain level. You rebalance your portfolio. Any event you can think of, you can program into the Chainlink Keepers. Chainlink nodes are constantly checking this registry, listening, looking for these events, and checking the contracts, checking for your specific requirements on when the event fires. Once an event does fire, in your smart contract, you define a function called perform upkeep, which says, okay, now the event has triggered, this is what I want you to do. Maybe the price of a certain asset hits a certain level and I want to rebalance my portfolio. You send that information to the Chainlink network, the decentralized Chainlink network, and the decentralized network will execute that transaction for you. So you no longer have to rely on any centralized individuals, any centralized intermediaries for doing this. And it's incredibly powerful. Now, end-to-end -end reliability is the promise of smart contracts. And we want these smart contracts to be as feature-rich as the Web2 world. So additionally, Chainlink nodes are completely customizable. They have a functionality called any API, where any API, any HTTP get, any HTTP post, anything can be called from a Chainlink node into your smart contract. So you can customize these nodes to do literally anything. Now, I say that with caution because a lot of people go into this and they go, oh, okay, cool, I'm just gonna spin up a node, I'm gonna use a single API, and boom, I got a crazy smart contract that brings in crazy data. But this goes back to having a centralized intermediary. So if you're gonna do something where you do get your own data providers, get, your own, get a group of node operators together, it's incredibly important to think about the architecture and get this decentralized network. Now, with that being said, for this hackathon, uh, a, a single node and a single API for an MVP, uh, excuse me, a, a minimum viable pr uh, product is great, and then we can worry about uh, decentralizing it afterwards. Trust minimize agreements, that's why we're here, and trust minimize agreements that can do all the functionality that we care about is what Chainlink provides for them. So where can I learn more? Docs.chain.link like I was saying before, has literally everything that you need to know. I absolutely, absolutely recommend, if you're looking to learn any of these things, there are tons and tons of documentation there, step-by-step -step guides, which will let you know exactly how to make these smart contracts as powerful as you need them to be. 77 smart contract use cases enabled by Chainlink. If you're at this hackathon and you're like, ah, I wanna think of something really cool to do, just Google this article, and there is 77 use cases there of fantastic ideas that you can make. Where else can I learn? Docs.chain.link, as I said. Blog.chain.link has a ton of tutorials, step-by-step -step guides, everything, and just basic smart contract and Chainlink information as well. Chainlink Developer YouTube has a ton of technical tutorials for you to just get started, get going, if you're a more visual learner. Solidity and Smart Contract Starter Kits. Uh, for those of you who are like, hey, I like Brownie. Great, we have a, a repo for you, and it's got like a little cute logo over here. The little, little brownie thing. I like Python. I like doing my execution in Python. Great. We have a repo for you. Hey, I like Hardhat. 
Awesome, we got a, a boilerplate repo with you. Hey, I like TypeScript, great, we got a boilerplate repo for you. I like DAP tools, I like Foundry, I like Truffle. We have boilerplate code for all of this. You can take it, fork it, send it, you're good to go. It's got testing, it's got mocking, it's got all these auto verification on Etherscan, it's got all of these great tools that you can just take, build and use, and build one of these amazing applications. So definitely check that out. Additionally, 100%, one of the best ways to learn is joining the community. The Discord chat is incredibly active. Stack Overflow has a chain link tag. Stack Exchange Ethereum has a chain link tag. The documentation, making issues on any of these GitHub repos, connecting with people on Twitter, connecting with people on Reddit. Join the community, ask questions. We're all learning on this journey together. And then additionally, for this hackathon at ETH Denver, we have $25,000 in link total we're giving out in prizes. We're giving two grand prizes of $4,500 for virtual and in-person, and then 16 prizes of $1,000 for virtual and in-person. And all you need to do to qualify is use Chainlink in your smart contracts. That's it. Could be Chainlink price feeds, could be Chainlink keepers, could be Chainlink VRF, could be Chainlink any API. It could be you run your own node infrastructure. It could be you, you help somebody out with the node infrastructure. It could be you improve other node um, operators' lives. Using Chainlink somewhere in your smart contracts, that's it. And that's the end of my presentation, so happy to take questions now. <laughs>